Got networking issues? Glasswire has got you covered. Check it out at the link below. What's up guys, CP Moddy here, back with another video and it's the age old internet conversation. If I've got a laptop and want to save power, should I disable CPU cores to save that power? Now the logic says yes, because well, less processing cores running means less power, right? Well today, we're going to be finding that out exactly and also too, by the end of this video, we'll actually have a solution for you to save power regarding the CPU itself. We'll look at disabling cores physically like what the internet says, but also to taking a look at another way of limiting performance and that is using the power settings built into Windows. And this has been around since like Windows XP or even earlier, we can actually limit how much the CPU can use. So along with core limitation, we'll also to go ahead and put some synthetic limitations on this guy to really see what will save you power. So the whole idea behind actually disabling cores has been around basically since, well, the laptop first came around. As laptops generally have less cores and generally have less processing power than their desktop companions to give you better battery life. However, with that being said, with a lot of new stuff coming out of Intel and also to AMD, that's uh, not so much the case anymore with most of them having the same amount of cores and threads. But my point still stands that the less cores and the less threads that you do generally have running will, generally speaking, save you some power. So the logic's pretty simple turn off some cores and save some power, right? Well, in order to actually understand whether this will work or not, we do need to take a quick moment and work out and actually look at how a modern CPU actually functions. Now, without going into a massive spiel about how they actually work, and there's actually a lot that goes into a CPU and how it all works, and definitely we could cover that in a totally different video, but to keep things simple, CPUs have boost states, they also do have low power states and idle states and a whole bunch of other states, that will allow them to save power when they're not necessarily being used. For example, if we take a look at this Intel Arc page with this particular CPU in this laptop, we see that we get a base speed, but also to a boost speed. So that's one of the states that the CPU can go into, a boost speed, and then also to when this guy's idling. So for example, when I'm recording this video right now, it's running at less than one gigahertz to save power. So there's actually a lot of different states that a CPU can go into, depending on what it's actually doing and the task it's doing. So if it's idling like this, it's going to be in more of an idle state with cores going to a sleep kind of mode uh, more often than just being completely maxed out and flat out. So the workload is spread across all the different cores and threads, which means a fairly lightweight task, especially when it's just idling like this. Now, this particular unit is a four core, eight thread machine. And let's just say that we run only two cores and four threads or half the processing power. In theory, we should get half the power used, right? Well, there's actually even more logic that goes behind it. Because we just mentioned all the power states that can go to, we also do need to keep in mind the workload. For example, running the operating system right now with a few things running in the background is spread across four cores and eight threads. If we just suddenly disable half of it, that same workload still needs to be carried out by the two cores and four threads that are remaining. So one would then say the CPU will have to spin up faster, not being able to achieve its super low states, get into some boost states even and use more power by disabling those cores. So if you just take a theoretical approach, that same workload still needs to get done and less cores are going to be working harder to get that job done. Or at least that's what you think in theory. And this is the idea that I've personally been going with for quite some time. For me, I never really thought about actually disabling cores because again, I've always been sort of, I guess, along with the theory that the same amount of work now needs to be carried out by less cores, thus using more power. For me, I've definitely been more on the side of actually limiting the CPU and having all the cores running, and that is what we're going to get into in just a moment. But first, let's take a look at our test guide today. We have here the Dell XPS 15 with the 6700HQ processor that is running at four cores and four threads, and here are the rest of the specifications for this particular CPU. And in my mind, this is a perfect laptop for today's testing. It's relatively modern with relatively new hardware 
and actually is a pretty beast mode laptop. I do have to say, if I'm ever going anywhere and need some decent processing power, this thing is definitely the first thing that I take with me. However, with that being said, there's a bit of a drawback too, and that battery life isn't exactly the world's greatest when it comes to this particular laptop. And then on top of this, this guy also too supports a BIOS that allows you to manually choose how many cores you want. So taking a look at this picture right here, we can actually see that we can choose how many cores we do run, and then it also too goes ahead and runs its hyper threading. So for example, if we choose one core, it's going to run one core, two threads, two cores, two cores, four threads, and so on and so forth. We kind of get the idea right here. Now for the rest of the laptop itself, I also do set the screen brightness to 100%, keyboard backlight to 100%, and also to the rest of the software, we did do some tweaking back in the registry and also to in the GP editor, because I did want to make sure that all the tests we did was 100% repeatable. So screen brightness was the same, keyboard brightness was the same, no background rubbish was the same, everything was the same across those tests. So the only thing that's going to be changing is the CPU cores themselves. Ambient temperatures for this room was 19.4 degrees Celsius and again the laptop was elevated up off the desk on this exact stand so we could get some airflow underneath so we weren't overheating too much as anyone who's going to be pushing a laptop probably knows they do get rather hot. So I did pick it up on this stand, it doesn't have a fan under there, it's just a general laptop stand uh, just to get a bit of airflow running underneath the laptop. So let's take a look at our first set of results. First testing up was disabling cores. I ran four cores, three cores, two cores, and one core, all of them with hyper threading because it is a Core i7. So along for the ride here, we do also to get, well, quite a few tests. So boom, here are our numbers. Now take a look at the CPU package power consumption. We see just 17.99 watts versus 33.98 watts on the dual core configuration and 42.86 watts on the tri-core and 53.80 watts on the quad core. So if we just take a look at those specific numbers, it looks like yes indeed. Under load, we are actually saving quite a bit of power when it comes to the actual CPU itself. Now I'm sure someone out there is going to say, hang on a second, that i 7s only got a 45 watt TDP, how the hell are you getting more than 45 watts? The answer is simply, I'm pretty sure the hardware monitor we're using is measuring in a slightly different way than Intel's measuring, so they're going to be ever so slightly different, but the test that we do did run here is going to be the same across the board. So to that one person who's pointed out this is a 45 watt chip running at 53 watts, cool it because I'm pretty sure we're measuring in a different location. And if we flip it over to the actual idle power state, we see just 0.43 watt difference on the CPU, which is actually really not bad. And just taking a look at the rest of these kind of wattages right here, from the actual total power that the laptop draws to the actual CPU package, we can see there's, yes, indeed, quite a bit of a difference when it comes to actually disabling cores. And that sounds actually really good, right? Well, not exactly so fast. If you disable cores, to try and save heat when you're actually using a computer. Unfortunately, I'm sorry, there was really no heat savings. Pulling up our temperature graphs right here, minimums were around the same temperatures, but maximums also too were basically the same, all of them up in the 90 degrees, and again, idling was around the same for the actual temperatures there. So if you're trying to cut back on temperature by disabling cores as a whole, you may get less temperature, but the cores themselves and also to the whole package is still going to be up in the 90s, so you're not really saving that much there. Same thing if you actually measure total power used from the battery itself, we use battery bar 3.6.6, which is a nice little way to measure how much battery is actually being used, and we found that there is about a 29 watt difference, but that only translates to a 1 hour 3 minute versus 1 hour 42 on the single core configuration, which is really only maximum difference of 39 minutes, which sounds like quite a lot until you actually start to use the computer and those paper numbers fly absolutely out of the window. Unfortunately, even a one core two thread system is absolutely unusable and it makes me feel so much better uh, knowing that laptops do not have one processing core anymore. The boot time was unbearably slow, it just lagged out, it was just one of the worst computing experiences I've ever had for quite some time. In fact, a $100 bargain basement laptop that's like three years old already 
already, you still would run circles around a laptop like this with only one core enabled, which was really disappointing to see. The single core itself kept maxing out at 100% and was almost always in the max boost state, so it was using a ton of power, getting kind of hot, and one thing that I didn't exactly measure, but it was definitely very apparent, was also to fan noise, and running on that single core configuration at 100% at max boost caused the fans to kick up quite often, and you might find that a little bit weird if there's only one core running, why the fans kicking up, and the answer is just because that one core is working so hard with this laptop. So even though that one core did get the best power consumption, or rather least power consumption, it was a nightmare to use both in terms of fan noise, in terms of using the operating system, it was definitely a really bad thing. We did go from 5 hours 43 minutes on our longest time down to 5 hours 8 minutes, which is a 35 difference, but again, when it comes to actually using this thing, it wasn't really that good. But okay, then let's do some more realistic testing. What if you wanted to go ahead and actually use half the processing power? So you got four cores, disable two of them, and hey, you still got 50% of the processing power. Well, let's pull up all our numbers and all our graphs so you guys can make your own judgments, but for me personally, sure the four core and eight thread configuration was definitely the best as it is our benchmark right here. And if we go ahead and take a look at our dual core four thread, it actually wasn't a too bad experience. We did see around the same temperatures in the temp zone. We also do see slightly better power consumption and also do slightly better power consumption as a whole from the laptop, but that really only translates to eight minutes better batch life at idle and under full load, it wasn't exactly the world's biggest gap between two cores four threads and also to four cores four threads which was well, not too bad there. However, the actual laptop itself was definitely fine. Boot times was also too fine and overall wasn't too bad. However, that uh, single core got 12 minutes on that boot time, but did manage to save eight minutes on battery. So I guess there we go. So I guess if you did want to disable half of your cores, don't get me wrong, you are still getting a benefit, but you're throwing out half of the performance for less than half of the actual results. So for me personally, I don't really see it that much of a worth. Again, like eight minutes of battery at idle isn't really the world's biggest difference. You could probably just run your screen on one setting lower brightness and get more battery life rather than losing half of the processing power of your CPU. So essentially disabling cores in my view isn't exactly the world's most practical solution. Don't get me wrong though, it does save you power, but in terms of a day-to-day -day basis, it's not very practical at all. If you were to go to single core, it's unusable. And if you were to disable half the processing power, if all of a sudden you need to jump into an application that needs that processing, power rather than just pushing a button within Windows you now have to restart the computer change your BIOS settings hope you don't brick things and then reboot back into Windows and continue where you were going so in terms of actual disabling it isn't exactly the world's best thing so how do we save power and the answer is pretty simple software limiting so inside of Windows since I think Windows XP times you actually were able to change the power management settings and actually choose how much of the CPU you do want to run so for example you can jump into this window right here and actually set the CPU to go no higher than 50% utilization. So let's say that you open up a task and it wants to max out the CPU. Well, rather than maxing it out, Windows will limit it at 50%, just take longer to go ahead and do. So it can actually save you power. Now the benefit of doing this is you're able to actually have all cores enabled. So you can hit those low power states that I did talk about at the start of the video, but also too, when you need it, you just push a button and all the cores are active, all the power is available to you. And it's one simple click away rather than rebooting and BIOS and all those kinds of things. So it is definitely a more practical solution to just push one button versus all the other stuff. So for testing in this particular test, I tested everything from 100% utilization all the way down to 10%. And take a look at these numbers. Damn, I am absolutely blown away with some of the numbers we did pick up here. And jumping in, we do see that idle temperatures, though, aren't exactly the world's most blowing away. We see that, well, this bottom line is basically the same across all of them because we do need to keep in mind that all four cores are still running throughout all of the tests. All we're doing is just stopping it from going to those higher CPU states. So baseline numbers are going to be the same across the board. But definitely looking at those high numbers in terms of temperatures, we get an extreme drop off in 
in the temp department when it comes to limiting the CPU. I mean, look at 10% CPU versus 100% in the temperature department. There's almost no temperature increase over on the 10% side versus the 100% side. Now, do keep in mind, we'll touch on this in a moment, 10% is kind of unusable, but my point still stands and the power saving side is also too reflecting here. With maximum power consumption at just 11.15 watts on the 10% versus the 53 watts of the 100%, this guy is absolutely sipping power when you start to really limit it. And if that was not enough, we get three hours and 45 minutes of battery under 100% load at the 10% setting. So we're getting a lot more battery life. In fact, we're almost getting the full battery life that you'd expect out of idle at just 10% utilization. Now, there is a downside with that being boot times on that 10% took 20 minutes to turn the computer on. So it's not exactly the world's most practical solution there, but if you wanted to leave it on 100%, boot it up and then change it down to 10, that is totally possible to do. Now, one other thing that was also too interesting to see was the actual CPU speeds. Now, we didn't actually notice this before, but when I started to actually limit the CPU, so go from 100 to 90, 80, 70, and so on, we actually saw the different boost states actually become, well, no longer available to the CPU. So the lower we go in terms of our utilization, the lower the clock speed also goes, which gives us a doubling effect. Not only are the CPUs not really working that hard the lower the states we go, but also too we're not using as much power because the CPU isn't spinning up to its higher gigahertz speed, which is a really nice thing to do. Now on day-to-day -day basis, the lower we went down all the way to about 30% really wasn't that noticeable. Browsing the internet, opening up Word, typing some documents, you really couldn't tell the difference between 100% and then also to down to around that 30 to 40%. How we're dropping below that is where we saw some more power savings and heat savings but then also to day-to-day -day usage was starting to get affected. Opening up a number of Chrome tabs at like 10% usage was a nightmare. And overall, the entire use case of the computer was just about a nightmare when running in those lower power states, but we did save power there. So not only was the CPU running lighter, but uh, also too wasn't running in those boost states for the actual lower settings. So TLDR time of this video, does disabling cores save you power on a laptop? Answer simply, yes. If you have a four core and eight thread laptop, you can expect to see about a 35 watt particular saving under load, going from four cores, eight threads, down to one cores, two threads. However, do keep in mind that 35 watt saving does sound impressive, but the laptop is basically unusable at that point and really, you shouldn't actually do that because there's no point in having the laptop running at one core and two threads. If you were to say half the actual usage, we could expect to see a much better use in case experience. However, we're only saving 19 watts of power, which translates to about 28 minutes under load and about eight minutes at idle in terms of its power savings. So, Losing 50% processing power to save eight minutes under lightweight and idle type of tasks, to me, isn't exactly the world's biggest saving. However, if you were into actually saving some power, the best thing to actually go ahead and do is use the Windows limitation function that allows you to limit how much CPU utilization you can actually do. And from the numbers that we did see in our testing here today, the best kind of sweet spot would be to leave all your cores active, but use the limitation to limit it to about 50 to 40% utilization where you still get a very usable computer, but you don't manage to hit those high boost states and also to manage to stay down and less consumption in terms of your power usage. So it isn't too bad here. So what should you do at home to save power? Pretty simple, create a custom power plan within Windows and limit that CPU to 50% and boom, you are done. If you need more power than 50%, chuck yourself on high performance for a little bit and if you need that power saving, chuck yourself on that custom power plan and you are done. But let me know what you do down in that comment sections to save power on your portable device. Is power saver enough or do you need a little bit more? Do let me know down below. Also too, if you wanna check out the XPS 15, you can find a link in that description box. But guys, thanks all for watching. I'll catch you all in the next one.